of Saints as they fall to the Jaguars 31 to 24 on the road. And the problems are starting to become very, very internal for the Saints. We already knew that they were internal, but now it feels like certain players are turning against each other. We've got some guys kind of airing out laundry on social media over others. And really, the Saints just continue to unravel with their BS at this point in the season. I want to give a shout out to First Down Saints here on YouTube. Go check him out at First Down Saints. He's a Saints exclusive YouTube channel. Dropped some great uh, content. Just found him not long ago. Subscribe to him as well. And he brought a Trevor Penning issue to my attention. And I'm just going to read it word for word here because he said it perfectly. I don't want to butcher it. And this encapsulates the decision making of the New Orleans Saints right now. So first down Saints says a few days ago, what the Saints coaching staff have done to Trevor Penning really doesn't sit right with me. They draft him in the first round, which is not Trevor Penning's fault where he's drafted, knowing that Trevor Penning is extremely raw and will need to be developed. He misses his whole rookie year slash offseason due to injury, which I won't say that's out of his control. First down Saints did say that here because you do have to take care of your body and put it in the right situation so you can succeed in the league, um, which, of course, that further delayed his development injury, whether no, no matter how it happened, the injury, you know, put Trevor Penning back. He starts his sophomore season kind of rough. He gets better and better every single week. Then after the offense's best performance to date, they decide to bench him due to some struggles in the run game that had no real significant impact on the games, unlike Pete Carmichael's crazy impact, negatively pushing this offense back for almost two seasons now. Then his replacement gets hurt, so they throw, th uh, they, they throw Trevor Penning back into the fire after a week of no first-team practice reps where the little bit of confidence he probably had was taken from him, just stripped from him due to his coaches basically giving up on him, not wanting to develop him, improperly using him. And then big surprise, he comes into the game and he struggles. And that perfectly encapsulates the coaching, personnel, decision-making, organization failure. That as much as that pains me to say, that is what the Saints are right now. That's just what the Saints are right now. You've heard me over the last few weeks. I'm not going to repeat myself, but there are some new things that have come forward with New Orleans. What's up, man? Good to see you, Ron. Appreciate you tapping into the show. Yeah, the trip was cool. We're actually talking about the, the Saints game right now. So again, I'm not going to repeat myself with the things I've said of the past times with Pete Carmichael and bad contracts and play calling. We know what every bit of that is. But now we're really starting to see Derek Carr and Chris Olave not be on the same page. And people are talking a lot about that third down throw that he sailed over his head. They're talking about Chris Olave quitting on routes. We're talking about even Derek Carr and Michael Thomas not being on the same page. Now we've got Michael Thomas defending Chris Olave against Derek Carr on Twitter. Credit to Nick Underhill for actually leaking, not even leaking, but putting this tweet out. And that's how I kind of know the locker room is starting to turn and the discipline and the culture of the Saints isn't holding up to what it used to be. Because Saints fans, hear me out for a second. Do we remember this real discipline culture before? Yes, some people called Sean Payton an asshole and he coached really hard, but we know what he did for the organization. You know, Brandon Cooks had his attitude. Oh, you know, uh, if, if uh, excuse me, if receivers aren't loud, they don't get fed. I love Brandon Cooks, but the Saints shipped him out. They didn't want to hear that. Jimmy Graham kind of got an attitude wanting to get paid maybe a little too greedily in terms of the Saints' eyes. I think he deserved whatever money he wanted. Saints send him out. Junior Gallette. Saints send him out because of attitudes. Dante Stallworth. Saints are sending him out. Like, they have had a history of guys that if they're not fitting the discipline or the culture of the team, they're going to send them out. And I'm not saying get rid of Derek Carr or Chris Olave or Michael Thomas, but when they started chirping, the Saints at least rectified that in some way, shape, or form. They got those situations solved, but not now, because now you have Chris Olave getting pissed at by Derek Carr because Derek Carr doesn't understand the play and Michael Thomas is coming in and defending the second-year wide receiver on the team. And I don't blame Michael Thomas because what Michael Thomas said was absolutely right. So, you know, we talk about Chris Olave cutting his route short, which does really suck. You hope that's not a work ethic. You hope that's not an attitude problem. I don't believe it is. Um, but with him being one of our best offensive players, I want to see him getting utilized as much as possible, giving that full effort, making those big catches and making those big plays when he needs to for the Saints team. But, you know, they're talking about the third down throw, which was way over Chris Olave said. Olave's job on that play was to pull the defense away from the targeting part of the field for Derek Carr where he was supposed to throw the pass. Chris Olave was not even drawn up to receive this ball on this play, nor was he even in the progressions on this play as well. 
If from what I'm remembering from Michael Thomas, Derek Carr was supposed to drop back. Taysom Hill was the first read. Rashid Shahid was the second read. Michael Thomas was the third read. And he's throwing the ball to Chris Olave. Chris Olave, yes, while he should have continued out that route, now we also have the players pushing back saying, oh, well, it kind of was an uncatchable pass and I wasn't intended for it on the play anyways. So, you know, what that says to me is Derek Carr is not learning his plays. He doesn't know them well enough to correctly place blame on the way the play isn't happening. And now we have, you know, Chris Olave basically saying, oh, yeah, I know I should have ran it out, but. And when you start having those, I know I should have done this, but I know I should have done that, but the excuses that start to come in just for humans in general, let alone with the football team, that naturally starts to bring division between people. And it's it's painful. It truly is painful watching as a Saints fan from the roster to the bad contracts to the anemic offense. And again, this week kind of unfolding some unfolded something new here, you know, for Saints fans. But if, if you want to know, because I, I didn't even want to bore you guys with Derek Carr's, you know, pretty rough performance in this game outside of the, you know, the final drive in the in the later quarters where we where we picked it up and we came to tie this football game, you know, 15 points in the fourth quarter. Derek Carr was missing wide open touchdowns, missing throws badly, yelling at everybody for his miscues. If you want to know a breakdown of what Derek Carr actually looked like in this game, how frightening it was of what Derek Carr missed in his football game and the play calling, check out the QB school with JTO Sullivan, Derek Carr week seven analysis analysis. It'll tell you everything you need to know, but the red zone issues from Derek Carr are not new because when you check the numbers, no quarterback over the last five years has a worse red zone completion percentage than Derek Carr. And that's what his issues have always been. And now the Saints have $150 million sunk into this guy. You're stuck with him. We know that the Saints are stuck with Derek Carr. He's an average quarterback. He was scraping top 10 on his best days. And he's not close to his best days now. Yes, Jameis could start, but the Saints won't do it with the money they have put into Derek Carr. Because you're really going to pay a quarterback 40-something million to sit on your bench for four years. No, that $150 million quarter, quarterback is going to be built around and is going to be taken advantage of in the best way to pair him with offensive talent and coaching. And the Saints are absolutely botching it. And that was my issue from the start. The money you gave him, and yes, I understand Mike McD- or not Mike McDaniels, Josh McDaniels, you know, really stinking up the joint, but uh, Devontae Adams had a career year. Josh Jacobs had a career year. And Derek Carr did not. The Raiders, who drafted him, who bought in on him to take him out of college after a decade, knew what their ceiling was with him. And the Saints said, that's okay. I'll go pay you $150 million to come coach, or not to come coach, to come quarterback this football team. And the Saints were so wrong. They couldn't have been more wrong. They, they, they had me. They kind of fooled me. I was hoping with this new regime of Dennis Allen, we had the Sean Payton conservative play calling. Dennis Allen was going to make it creative, air it out more, which we've seen some, but the, the way that the schemes are called for the structure of the deep shots is horrible. Derek Carr comes in. I know he's better than Jameis, not crazily better than Jameis, but I'm hoping for better decision-making. I know he's got a big arm. I know he can make plays, in my opinion, more than Jameis can. And Derek Carr is on pace to throw 17 passing touchdowns this year. Again, no quarterback over the last five years has a worst red zone completion percentage than Derek Carr does in the NFL. And let's not act like Derek Carr was great, you know, a couple of years before he came to New Orleans. We knew that he was falling off as it got later in his career. And that's why, again, the Raiders did not trade him. The Raiders cut him. They knew what they had with him, and they kicked him to the curb. And Derek Carr's pick six was, was horrible to watch in person. I was eating my words immediately. I told my lady before I went, I said, hey, I'd love to see a pick six at this game. I'd never seen a pick six in a football game. Well, you bet your sweet ass I got one. And it was Derek Carr throwing a horrible, horrible pass. And I had great seats at the game. So I, I saw it from snap to whistle. And it was not pretty. It was not pretty to watch at all. You got Dennis Allen continuing to deny anything and everything at the podium. I mean, absolutely ridiculous. What's up, fellas? Checking in on the chat now? I know that feeling. Yeah, he looked trash. Go Cal. Here he goes, man. I know Derek Carr looked trash. I shouldn't even start reading your GC comments. I don't even want to say the comment. I'm just going to abbreviate them for you, for you, Mr. Christopher. But, you know, Dennis Allen continuing to deny anything and everything at the podium. He, he's literally a bot. I've told you guys this. He is not good at the podium whatsoever. And you can tell that him and Pete 
are just not all mentally there, all tapped in, actually want to be with this football team, it feels like. So he was asked about the growing pains for this offense, and Dennis Allen goes, okay, well, it's time for those growing pains to be done. So the reporter comes back and says, okay, what if those growing pains aren't gone? DA says, I will cross that bridge when they get there. You don't know when the bridge is there, clearly, because we were there weeks ago. You clearly don't have a solution. That's why you're saying that, DA. And are we not already there? Are we not already at a point to where this Saints team has a worse offense this year than it did last year, and we have better players? And that's just facts when you look at the numbers and you look at the rosters. It's even getting so bad now to where the special teams is dreadful. Blake Groupie and Lou Headley were awesome stories when we signed them, no doubt, but they got to go. The Saints are in the bottoms of the league in yards per punt inside the 20 punts, and they are dead last, Lou Headley is specifically, in punt hang time. His punts do not hang in the air for long. They're getting to the defender, or excuse me, to the to the return team very quickly. And I'm just honestly tired of seeing my Saints offense get on the field three and out, running a few plays, and then Lou Headley can only give me a 33-yard kick. And after a return, they're damn near in plus territory. I mean, come on. And would you know that the Saints have the most punts in the NFL with 35? The Saints have 35 punts in the NFL on the season. Yeah, just let that sink in. 35 divided by 7. Saints are punting five times a game. Five punts a game. Horrible. We, all, we, we basically have as many punts a game as Derek Carr has passing touchdowns on the season. Now, Blake Groupie, 16 for 20 on the year. We see him missing field goals, though. He's got a missed kick in this game, and his misses are just so major. Again, he is 16 for 20, but when you are 80%, and you're a rookie kicker. We see the leash is not long for some of these guys. That's why the Justin Tuckers and the Young Way Coos are so elite. They stay with the same team because they understand. They keep doing what they're doing. They're not going to have to worry about a job. And I think it's about time that Blake Groupie and Lou Headley possibly start worrying about a job. You see Will Lutz over in Denver. He's 12 for 13. Now let's just get into a little more of what the Saints are actually looking at here in terms of salary cap hell, the trade deadline coming up. And then we'll finally talk about the game some. I just got a few takeaways from, from the game. So the Saints are in legit salary cap hell. We already knew that walking into the year. We've seen the Saints year over year kick the can down the road, contract, contract, veteran, aging player, untradeable. If the New Orleans Saints cut every player on their roster next year that had a positive salary cap savings, a.k.a. if the Saints cut them and they were able to make money based on what they still owe them, <laughs> The Saints would create $15.4 million in cap room. So probably not even making a million bucks a player. That's how bad these contracts are. That's how badly they're pushed out. The Saints are currently around $85 million over the cap. So it can possibly feel like a situation where you can't even reset anymore. Because it might not be feasible. If the Saints cut every player on their roster next year, and they were able to save money on every player that they cut, they would only make $15.5 million. That's horrible. And it's things like that that make me look deeper on Sean Payton and Mickey Loomis and just really make me want to implode it that much more because there's only one way to go. There is only one way to go at this point, and it is you ransack this coaching staff and you draft your quarterback of the future. And you, well, yeah, you could sit there and say, oh, Adam, we're, we're, we're three and four. The trade deadline's coming up. Let's get draft capital. Who wants these contracts? Who wants these aging veteran players? You're the oldest roster in the NFL. These are horrible, bad, backloaded contracts. Marshawn Lattimore's, Alvin Kamara's, Michael Thomas's putrid money that he even got. Hey, Mike, Mike is playing up to the standard, though, so I appreciate him. Derek Carr, Cam Jordan. Ryan Ramchek, who wants those? Because those are your players, right? No one's going to take Carr. But maybe if Ramchek was healthy, you could get something for him. And what makes me even more nervous is knowing how far out the Saints are financially. Chris Olave might not sign a second contract with the New Orleans Saints. And that's just a sad reality. As much as I love Olave, as much as I was so happy that Chris Olave came into this season, came into the league with the New Orleans Saints, knowing how badly we needed him. And in order for the Saints to save money because of how Olave could possibly be, I could see Chris Olave not signing a second contract with the Saints because that's how far, that's how far out they are. All right, just a few takeaways here 
from the Saints Jags game. Then we're going to get into a break. Why are you surprised the Saints? I've always had that four for it in the future mentality. I don't know exactly what you're saying there, man. Um, I mean, I'm surprised because I'm a Saints fan, bro. I expected us to win this football game. I drove 840 miles to watch this game. That's why I'm shocked, Christopher G. But within the game itself, I'll give cover to, uh, tre- uh, credit to Trevor Lawrence. He was great. And the coaching was a prime example of how you deal with situations. They did what they needed to do with quick hitters, not letting him hold the ball too long because he did have the brace on his ankle. And even with that, on a bum leg, a few major key scrambles to extend drives in this game. He was the leading rusher for the Jags. To know that the Saints forced two very weird turnovers that went in favor of them. By the way, at the game, it was very funny. New Orleans, you know, the city was running a special. The Saints turned two, uh, forced two turnovers and get like 20 bucks off on their car work or something. And all the Jags fans are like, oh, hell no, that ain't going to happen. Not at all. Literally the next two times the Jags touched a football, that was a turnover. One from Jamal Agnew, and then they had a fumble as well. But despite all that, the Saints only netted three points. The Saints defense, again, only gives up 24 points. But because of that pick six and the miss, you know, pick six from Derek Carr, the miss kick from Groupie, that's the points they're continuing to leave on the field, and that's what they're going to remember. They even held the Jags to two of 11 on third down, but it's not like the Saints were better going three of 18 on third down themselves. And and Foster Moreau, I mean, we know it, man. We know you got to catch that football. Was I pissed? Yeah. I watched you dropped it from the sands. The NFL memes Instagram account is just all over us, but shit happens, right? 99 times out of 100, you probably catch that football. Hell, even 100 times out of 100. I I understand things happen. It was a great play that was drawn up, though. Apparently, and this shows how funny this is, I wouldn't have faith in Pete Carmichael to draw up something this wide open and this good looking. Apparently, Derek Carr, Foster Moreau, Kamara, and Michael Thomas came up with that play. And, And again, I believe it. Because an open scheme that close to the goal line on third down is a beautiful play. But we just got to look at the last drive of the game. I mean, Pete Carmichael calling four plays on that red zone drive to end the game, and three of those weren't good. So the first play, you go back to the fade from Michael Thomas. I'm not necessarily mad at that. That's a play you just scored on. I didn't like the play call at first, but of course it takes a freak like Michael Thomas to make that catch. I didn't even like the throw from Derek Carr, but you know Michael Thomas turned back the clock on when we did score. No, I'm not mad about it. You just score on that play. We hear teams say all the time, why didn't they go back to that play? They scored on that. Well, we did. So, all right, that's fine. You got three plays, three timeouts. Pete Carmichael, do exactly what you want, man. I mean, not exactly what you want because clearly what you've doing what you want has gotten us to this point. Three plays, three timeouts, and the Saints decide to come up with an airmail over the middle to Taysom Hill. Then a fade to Chris Olave? I mean, come on. You just threw a fade to Michael Thomas. Where's... Why not a fade to Foster Moreau? Why not a fade to Jimmy Graham, who didn't even get a snap in the red zone in this game? There was no Jimmy Graham featured here. This is what Jimmy Graham did in the NFL his whole career, even with him being old and battered now and back with the Saints. Jimmy Graham performed in the red zone. And that's not happening right now with the Saints. Pete Carmichael is not incorporating him well enough to actually get him even on the field for snaps. Jimmy Graham would have caught that pass. No question about it. But it just here shows how predictable the Saints are. And then we'll get into the break. For the show. Jimmy Graham for the season. The Saints run the football away from his side of the line every time. They don't even run it his way for the blocking aspect, let alone throw it to Jimmy Graham, who's probably the biggest player on the field. And one of the biggest targets the secondary would have to cover. Lynn Bowden Jr. and Key Kirkwood are also on the field in general for 60% of regular offensive snaps, and the Saints more time than not run the football. Teams can see this. We don't regularly bring in Jimmy Graham or Lynn Bowden or Keith Kirkwood. So when guys see those players trot on the field, they know more times than not, with all the offensive firepower the Saints have, they're going to run the football. Not to mention, you've got Jags players saying, we know he likes to check down. We know what Derek Carr does. Check down, check down, check down. We're going to block everything on the back end. We'll let you check it down up front. We'll rally and tackle and hold it down and win this football game. And that's exactly what the Jaguars did. I said it last week. The Saints are stuck. They're not going anywhere anytime soon. The Saints now, with Dennis Allen inheriting a fairly decent situation, yes, the contracts were going to be there, but you had the players and the talent to perform basically off-rip. We see what the Gardner Minshews of the world are able to do 
and all these other backup quarterbacks out there are able to do in certain games. We remember what Teddy Bridgewater was able to do for the Saints, and the Saints cannot engineer a thing. Dennis Allen is 18 and 42 as a head coach, and the Saints are going nowhere fast. What's crazy is the bottom, it's not far, but it does feel like it could get a lot worse. In this game, again, more BS. It felt like the game was lined up perfectly for the Saints. I mean, the Jags were playing their third game in 12 days on two different continents, just coming from London, a banged up Trevor Lawrence, a missing top corner for the team in Tyson Campbell, and the Saints fall 31 to 24, three for 18 on third down, and Derek Carr throws a pick six. 